Please stand for the words of our King. Our Gospel lesson this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, the first 12 verses. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, He went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to Him and He began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So far our text. Please be seated. Dear Christian friends, welcome to the Savior's Sermon. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Just a couple... um, Items of note here. When you look at verse 1 again, he went up on a mountain. See, now when the crowd saw him, he went up on a mountainside, sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Some people think that this is just a sermon for Christians, just for his disciples, instead of the whole masses. It's kind of an open question, because we don't know the acoustics. There's something to be said that if he wanted to speak to the whole crowd, he would have sat at the base and spoke up to the mountain? I don't know. I think all God's word is useful for teaching, rebuking, and training in righteousness. I love it. So we're going to address it as such. Next week, we're going to take a little detour and talk about David on the roof walking around in the afternoon. But for now, let's talk about the Beatitudes. He starts off each one of these saying, Blessed. Blessed, blessed, blessed. What does that mean? It's hard to get your arms around it. And you kind of heard me talk to the children in the children's message and say, happy are the sad, and that's not a terrible way to look at it. I think that the second reading that you heard is another good commentary on this. The world does not get it. That's why this is Trust in the Lord Sunday, because you're not going to see this on primetime television. You're not going to hear anyone else in our society tell you these things. But Jesus will. It's possible that when they look at you, my goodness, they woke up on a freezing morning and went to church? Are they miserable? And you would describe the happiness that you have as a Christian. Happiness doesn't even touch it, does it? It's this unending joy of the Christian walk. A contentment that Jesus talks about when he says, blessed. Well, let's jump into our first. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I know in 2023, if you told someone, if you are poor, you are blessed, they'd probably take a step back and say, why? And I know that God's not talking about money here, but any poverty of any kind, you might say, sounds like a bad idea. But, I got to tell you a story. There was a Pharisee and a tax collector that walked into the local synagogue. Call it church. And the Pharisee stood there and he said, God, I thank you that you've made me awesome. Unlike these losers who sin all the time, I don't. I made extra rules to follow because the ones you gave me were too easy. And then the tax collector beat his breast called upon his God and said, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's it. He was a cheat and a crook, and he knew it, and he didn't know what to do or how to get out. But he knew that he was wrong. Jesus says, which one of those two left church that day forgiven? With a poverty of spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Christian, when you walk out knowing that you are poor and broken and a beggar, 
you are truly wealthy and the kingdom of heaven is yours. And it's not just yours in a few years down the road. It's yours right now, Christian. You enjoy that eternal life. That's your reality. Because you are blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The next one kind of follows right in line. You're going to see a logic as we go forward with each of these. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Laugh, and the world laughs with you. Weep. Some of you knew it. Weep, and you weep alone. That's true. You might say that's when you find out who your friends really are, right? Anybody wants to come and have a party with you. It's when you're in misery, when the chips are down, so to speak. Who comes to your side and loves you? In the book of Acts, we see this commentary. You must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Now, there are two kinds of hardships as I look at this. There's the hardships that you bring upon yourself because of your own sinful actions. And then there are some bad, just bad things that happen to you. And there are consequences for life no matter what you do. We're going to get into that a lot in our study after worship. For example, if you smoke a pack a day for 60 years, you're probably going to have cancer. No one would be surprised in this room. But on the topic of sorrow, for all of the misery that goes along with life, you can finish this statement. When in sorrow, God will never leave you. And God will work out all of that sorrow for your eternal good. You could say, if you are poor in spirit, yes. Well, the next thing is, blessed are those who mourn. When the poor in spirit see their sin, there is a very real sorrow over sin, a mourning, a repentance. Ash Wednesday is right around the corner, folks. Because that's what we do. And the problem is that Satan won't leave you alone. That guilt is terrible. And he likes to rub your nose in that sin. And Jesus says, well, happy are, are you who are sad. He says, I will comfort you. The verse says that they will be comforted. This isn't something that you can find deep within yourself. It's not how this works. This is an alien comfort that comes from the outside and hits you in the gospel. You will be comforted. The next one is, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. You probably already knew that Jesus didn't invent this statement. Uh, if you know your Psalms by heart, I just rediscovered it doing a little study. This is Psalm 37. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. You see, these truths, yes, Jesus kind of summarizes all of them in this beautiful sermon that he preaches, especially the beginning in these Beatitudes. But these truths are all over the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus is a great example of meekness. What does that mean? Well, Peter writes, When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. I've seen this over and over and over again. I don't care if you're on a sports team, a sports field, or court I don't care if you're in a group or association, a PTO or a church. Something happens where you are offended. What do you do? Do you defend your honor? Someone besmirched my Minnesota Vikings. How dare they? That's ridiculous if you're not a Viking fan. But that is real. Of course, it's ridiculous. It's what do you do with that? There's no reason you have to do with this. If someone harms you in some way and they lash out against you, in meekness you could say, maybe they're having trouble at home. Maybe their marriage is on the rocks. Maybe their dog died. There are a hundred different reasons that people gunny sack problems in their life and they bring it to you. Christian, you can in meekness take it, turn the other cheek, and respond in love. How striking is that? David writes in Psalm 37, and he just keeps going, I was young and now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. 
the Lord will continue to fulfill our needs. Because blessed are the meek. They will inherit the earth. The next one. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. for They will be filled. You kind of see we're kind of riding that mountain up. Things keep on getting better. God fills needs. Spiritual ones too. And so, uh, listen to this commentary. This is the Apostle Paul in Romans. Righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. This is this alien righteousness I was talking about. It comes from God. And I like, to, I like the picture of a bucket. I've used this before. Where your life, you are full of righteousness, right? And it's like there's a hole in the bucket. Because every day in thought, word, and deed, sin just leaks out the bottom and that righteousness keeps on going down. And I could not find a picture of a guy holding a, a bucket under a waterfall. Nobody's done it. I need to do that. Because that's the accurate picture that your God gives you here. It's not just, well, it's at the rim today. It's overflowing all the time, every day. That is your life of righteousness. The floodgates are open. And Jesus goes on in the Gospel of John to tell you exactly how this works. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Someone <laughs> recently asked me if it's hard to be good all the time. And I thought that was kind of funny. Like they don't, they don't hang around me long enough to realize that I'm not good all the time. But again, Christian life isn't one of misery. And I, I think you can say happy are the sad. And those who don't come from our background of Christianity don't understand it. You've heard the expression that God helps those who help themselves? I think that's wrong. I think God helps those who help others. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Is there anyone who needs help? Spiritual or temporal? Christian, you can do that. It's good to help people right around us in our church, of course. But it's even better to help our enemies, is it not? James writes this, Suppose a brother or sister is without clothing and daily food. If any of you says to him, Go, I wish you well. Keep warm and well fed. But does nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? There's other stories. The classic example would be the parable of the Good Samaritan. And if you've ever watched the series The Chosen, they put a little twist on it. And it's just fantastic. I don't have time to go into it now, but it, it's worth your time. Why are we happy and blessed for being merciful? It's because God's merciful to us. We offer nothing to God. Again, we stand before Him as beggars. And He doesn't leave our head empty. He richly supplies all of our needs. And that would include mercy. Well, next one, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. I, I think Satan always comes at you and anything good that you have in life, he can twist it and make it an evil if you just let him. He can turn a Christian walk into one of pride where you rejoice not in the fact that your name is written in heaven, but that you're such a good person. It doesn't take very much, just a small little thing. That's why I tell you, as you walk out of this church, I don't care what you think of my sermon, don't say, Pastor, fantastic sermon. Because guess what that feeds inside Pastor Fred? This little Pharisee that just keeps on growing and thinks, man, am I awesome. You can thank me for the gospel. That's okay. But just be aware that all of that, it, there's this little pride right inside of all of us. Well, how will the pure see God? Maybe you should back up and say, how are you pure? King David helps us again once more in the Psalms. Create in me a pure heart, O God. Pure motives comes from a thankful heart, overwhelmed for what our God has done for us. And so how will you see God? I don't see God as the disciples did 2,000 years ago as he walked around. And yet I do see God at work. 
I know that He's present with us. Wherever two or three are gathered in His name, there I am. He is present in our work because we are the body of Christ. And John says that there is more to come. It only gets better. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. I can't wait for the day when we will see God face to face. We go on, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Do you know why some people watch a NASCAR race? Do you know why some people watch a hockey game? Do you know why some people watch the running of the bulls in Pamplona, Spain? Because they like to see a car wreck, a fight, or someone get gored. It's perverse. It is. And yet that's kind of how, I don't want to say that's how God made us, because we're going to get into that again in our after worship Bible study. That's the sinful nature inside of us. Because we love to see the want and destruction. It's bad. Your God says that you're different. Blessed are the peacemakers. Watch the NASCAR race praying that nobody ever gets hurt. It's a dangerous sport. Most of them are. You're just different, Christian. You're a peacemaker. Jesus is your Prince of Peace. And I know that peace that we talk about at Christmas time is the peace between God and man that was wrought when Jesus died on the cross. And yet that peace spills over into your daily life. It does. You will be called sons of God. People will recognize who you are. And the writer to the Hebrews reminds us that you can make every effort to live in peace for all men. An eye for an eye? Do you realize that that was meant to limit revenge? Because if someone takes out your eye, you're probably going to try to kill them. That's not what you do. You can turn the other cheek again. God helps those who help others. Well, you are blessed, my friends. And do you know if you share a birthday with someone famous? Uh, maybe you share a favorite sports team with your pastor? Maybe. Maybe uh, you share a faith with some special people? Well, listen to what your, your God says here in verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus ends the beatitude the way he started, pointing to heaven. And even though you try to make peace with the world, don't think for an instant that the world's going to try to make peace with you. And I know it's heartbreaking to see this more and more every day. But don't expect it to change or be improved. Expect persecution. Do not go out and seek it, Christian. That is never commanded. Rejoice that you get to live in any kind of peace and that I get to stand here in a public forum and proclaim God's word. Because you can't do that everywhere around the world. But we do. Finally, it is neat to share your birthday with someone. Know that you are blessed because you share something in common with these heroes of faith. Verse 11, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Persecutions are one reminder that you're a Christian, but they're not the best. The best reminder is God's word and hearing what he says about you, Christian. However, you can be different in school and swim against the stream. You can love people who are unlovable. You can be a witness to the truth of your God in a society that wants absolutely nothing to do with it. And you won't always be loved for that. You are blessed. I, I have to say, have you ever had a bad day? This is one of those prophets he just defeated the prophets of Baal and everyone around him cried out, the Lord, he is God. And yet in a matter of 24 hours, everyone left him. In the despot, a woman named Jezebel condemned him to die. And he hit despair hard. 
He sat under a tree and said, God, take me now. I don't want to live anymore. I've never been to that place. But what I'm trying to tell you is that persecution can be vicious. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba and Judah, he left his servant there. Well, he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. Elijah had a bad day. And what I'm telling you is that I can say blessed over and over and over again, but it doesn't change the truth that you have bad days, Christian. I'm not naive. I live in the same world you do. And yet, you share the same faith as this prophet who was picked off his feet, dusted and sent on his way because he wasn't done yet. And if there is breath in your lungs, God is not done with you either. When Jesus' human lips reveal him as God, may you see that we can be happy when everyone around us expects us to be sad because you're different. Because you don't trust what everyone else says. You trust in the Lord. And that is the Savior's sermon for you. You can actually say, Happy are the sad. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We now confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. In a world that has difficulty believing in the one true God, but is so ready to believe that our universe happened by 